Hi everybody and welcome. Today is going to be a quite a typical video for the Sound of AI channel. Rather than uh, showing you some code or AI audio music projects, I'm going to analyze a piece of music which I found quite interesting. Of course, I'm going to also sprinkle in a little bit of music processing using a Libreza to extract temper curves, but that will come and it's going to be just a... Uh, kind of a tiny part of this video. I was listening to a bunch of songs from the Eurovision 2021 uh, contest and I found one to be particularly interesting. Well, a disclaimer is due here. So as some of you who've been following me for quite some time may know, I'm not really that much into pop music or rock music in general, hip hop, this kind of stuff. I have a background as a classical musician. That's what I love the most, along with contemporary music, jazz, a little bit of progressive rock, this kind of stuff. So Eurovision is not really my cup of tea. But nonetheless, I was listening to um, this year's uh, songs and I found one to be particularly interesting. The song that I want to talk about is called Shum by the Ukrainian band Go A. The super cool thing about this song is that it managed to mix very nicely styles that are quite far apart. On the one end of the spectrum we have techno electronic dance music. On the other side of the spectrum we have folk Ukrainian traditional music. And the mashup of these two styles was quite interesting and fresh and definitely something completely unique for Eurovision. Now, how did they manage to create this cool mashup? Well, uh, the main point here, I believe, is the use of Ukrainian instruments or instruments from the Ukrainian music tradition. One of these instruments is the supilka, which is a sort of pipe instrument that similar to a flute or a whistle and then they also used another instrument traditional instrument called drimba and this is a kind of uh, mouthpiece that they use to reinforce the the sung part well here all of these instruments when we'll review like the the, the song uh, together what about the structure of this song well the structure is quite typical I would say for most of it so it has a verse that repeats quite a lot that leads into a chorus. A verse and chorus share more or less the same chord progression, so nothing fancy about that. But there are a couple of bits in the structure which are quite interesting. First of all, you have a break towards the beginning of the song, an instrumental break, and there you can definitely see the this kind of like folky vibes coming um, out very, very strongly. And then towards the, the middle of the track, the middle or three-fourths of the, the track, you have a sort of a bridge where the music completely slows down and then it builds up in a kind of folky way using this sort of a ritualistic formulaic uh, music patterns which repeat always the same but faster, faster and faster. So. Yeah, these two elements, the initial short instrumental and this bridge building up are very interesting and injected into the song a lot of freshness and a lot of the, its musical folky vibe that it has. What about the chord progressions? Well, the chord progressions or the harmony is a relatively simple. So you have a simple chord progression that repeats more or less the same throughout uh, the song. And for those of you who are familiar with basic harmony, this is a one tonic that goes to uh, dominance and we have six, uh, subdominant three, and then a six grade uh, of the scale. So this is like quite uh, ordinary stuff. The one thing that is interesting about the, from a harmonic aspect though, is that the, the music is in minor. So the, the song is fully in Aeolian mode or natural minor scale. This is something quite atypical, I would say, for a song that goes to Eurovision, because they usually always use um, major modes. But 
it's not that atypical for a uh, folk song because they use a lot of modes and Aeolian is definitely one of those. The inspiration for this song came directly from a traditional folk song that a Ukrainian uh, sing and the meaning of the song is also quite cool. It's basically peasants who sing to a god or goddess of the forest to just uh, talk about spring that's uh, awakening. And this is also a quite cool theme that Goe used, and they created this sort of analogy between spring and what's happening right now after, or, well, we're still in the pandemic, but we're starting to see the light towards the end of the tunnel. So they created this cool analogy of life awakening uh, once again and us coming out of this very dark uh, moments that we lived through over the last year, year and a half. Above all, there's one aspect of this song which is fantastic and completely innovative. It's the clever usage of tempo. Now, what's tempo? Of course, most of you may already know this, but for the few of you who don't, tempo is just represents, indicates the speed and the pace of the music. What Goy managed to do uh, with Shum is having tempo that modulates, a dynamic tempo that changes throughout the song. Now, this is something that is not done at all in techno music or in Eurodance or dance music, EDM music more in general. It's rarely the case where you have uh, the tempo, the beat that changes over time. It stays stable throughout the song. In Shum, the tempo changes contributed to the overall drive of the song and creating these hills and mountains of tension. The tension, in other words, works in pair with these tempo changes. The higher the tempo, the higher the tension of the song. The slower the tempo, the slower the level of tension. This is something that's quite typical in music which is performative in its nature, like classical music or jazz uh, music, but it's not really that typical in music that's very quantized, which follows strictly agreed like electronic dance music. And at the same time, this sort of accelerandos, which is just uh, speeding up, and ralentandos, which is slowing down, are typical of folk music, which, of course, are a form of uh, performative music as well. So now, without any further ado, let's take a look at the tempo curve of Schum. In the process, let's also take a quick look at how we can extract the tempo curve for any song using Librosa. Here's a Jupyter notebook that I created to extract tempo from songs. For those of you who are not interested in coding, just skip ahead. But for those of you who are, just stick with me for a couple of minutes. So um, first thing, we import a Librosa and Matplotlib. So Librosa, I'm sure most of you will be familiar with it, but this is a package that does music processing in Python, and it allows us to extract all sorts of, um, I would say, audio features and music features. Then here, what we do is we load uh, the song, uh, which I have stored as an MP3 file in the working directory, and the file name is Shom MP3. Okay, here we, we extract both Y and SR. SR stands for the uh, sample rate. Y is just the time series that we loaded. Next, we extract tempo. And how do we do that? Well, with Librosa. So we do Librosa.beat.tempo. This is a function where we pass the time series, the uh, um, sampling rate. We say that we um, don't want to aggregate and we pass the hop length. Okay, so here we have the tempo. Now what next? Well, we should change, well, we, we want to get like, the x-axis of the graph that we'll have as seconds, not frames. Given 
tempo is an array where each index in that array is a frame, corresponds to a frame, what we want to do is pass from frames to time. And we can do that with a simple function that comes directly with Libreza and it's Libreza.frames to time. Here we pass the number of frames and then we pass also the hop length that we used. Okay, and finally, we use uh, matplotlib for uh, creating a graph of a tempo over time. So now on the x-axis we have um, time or the duration of the song and it expressed in seconds. And as you can see, the song is just shorter three minutes. On the y-axis, on the other hand, we have tempo. Now, what do we notice about this tempo curve? Is that, well, there's a lot of ups and downs, right? And you'll notice that here we're also going to have like, quite, or we actually have quite a lot of artifacts. And that's because it's quite difficult for these algorithms to, to, to get this nuanced uh, up and down in terms of uh, tempo. And we'll just like take a look at that and see what works and what doesn't work with this algorithm while we listen to the, to the music. But one thing that I want to say is that this is a kind of um, temper curve that would, it's, could be at first sight typical of a classical music or performative music, but not of techno music. Because as I said, for techno music, most of the time, just would have a horizontal line because you don't have any tempo changes. So now, Let's listen to the music and uh, notice how the tempo changes and how it affects the perceptual uh, aspects of the music itself and how it affects the, the tension and the urgency of the music. Here we go. <laughs> This is the part which is quite stable in time. Here comes the beat. Okay, so just a, an interesting aspect here. So you may have heard the, the singing, which is quite a typical, right? And that's because this is a technique which also comes from the traditional uh, folk music realm. It's called white singing, and it's found in Eastern Europe folk music. So they're also using this particular type of singing, which makes the, the music even more folkish in terms of vibe okay so we heard this initial part which is tempo wise quite stable and here we are getting into that break initial in instrumental break and here you have this again folkish vibe through the sopilka uh, flute instrument here we go <laughs> And here, tempo is getting up, right? And with that, also, tension is going up. The instrumentation is also thicker, with the pitch, which is thicker. We're going off once again with tempo. Okay, so here you get the first artifact. It goes up very much, too much in tempo, like the, this algorithm, but it's not 200, almost 200 in terms of BPM. So I guess like the, the algorithm got confused here because the bit is not there anymore and it's difficult like, to figure out what's going on. But then 
you have a drop in the BPM, which is quite dramatic, and that actually happens. Let's listen to this. Here we go. Okay, so this is the, the bridge or the second break, if you will, and you have this very folkish, very ritualistic type of music, which is always repeating the same pattern, but gaining speed every time until you get to the apex or the climax there, and then everything explodes. The Supilka is back in creating this melodic pattern, right? That repeats. Okay. And here we actually have the final climax. Here, tempo once again starts to getting up. Tempo goes up. The end of the song with this high note, it's possibly the climax of the whole track, which built up, built up, built up until it get there, back to uh, the tonic, back home with this high note. Well, I think like this is amazing. I mean, I'm not really that into like techno music or anything like that, but uh, I was so intrigued by this music is, I think like it, it worked very well and indeed like it got like the, the second place in terms of like audience vote at Eurovision because it's quite catchy but at the same time it has all of these sorts of folk tradition music in it and all of these uh, tricks and aspects we come which come directly from folk music which makes it uh, quite unique. So yeah, all in all, I really enjoyed it. I hope like you, you enjoyed also like this video, which was quite different from what I usually do here. And I'll see you next time. Take care.